My name is Hamilton Morris. I make a documentary series about psychedelics called Hamilton's Pharmacopoeia, and I do some chemistry research as well. Uh, I would say like a, a very chemistry-oriented and maybe anthropology-oriented psychedelic TV show that showcases a lot of things that I find interesting about the field. Yeah, I'm very interested in psychoactive chemicals in general. I am most interested in psychedelics, but I don't think that other classes are bad or that there's some kind of opposition between pharmaceutical substances and psychedelic substances or amphetamine is evil and LSD is good. I don't have that kind of simplistic um, moral dichotomy that, that many people seem to have. Uh, but it really happens to be the case, I think, that there's a lot of great stories surrounding psychedelics and they have a very rich history. So it's not even so much about my personal interest in them as much as I think that the stories that are being, the stories that are out there to tell about them just happen to be some of the most fascinating stories about chemistry and psychoactive drugs in general. Um, well, they do something that no other class really does, where they promote just a, a very, very different type of consciousness that doesn't, potentially doesn't exist at all. I mean, you can make various arguments that it's like dreaming or that it's like um, transcendent states of meditation or that it's like religious epiphanies or that it's like this or like that. But I think the fact of the matter is that many people would go through their entire life, if not most people, without ever having an experience that approached a psychedelic state if it weren't for psychedelic drugs. So they offer something that I think is totally extraordinary in that regard. Whereas stimulants and sedatives, they're kind of variations on a theme that is present in everyday human consciousness. So when you try amphetamine or something like that, you might think, oh, I feel fantastic, I have more focus, I have more energy, I'm not tired anymore. But you wouldn't say, this is a type of consciousness that I never knew was possible. Or maybe you would, but it would be an exaggeration. Um, whereas I think that you can say that without hyperbole when you're talking about LSD or psilocybin. And they have such a rich history. And for someone like me that is an atheist, materialist, sort of scientifically oriented person, they offer what is maybe the closest type of experience to a religious experience. I don't, I wouldn't use that word. I don't know what word uh, is appropriate to describe it, but it's the closest to that that someone like me can experience. And that in and of itself is really fascinating. Um, I think that there is a sort of increased openness to certain ideas that would be unattractive otherwise. You know, I'm also probably a somewhat cynical person, and I try not to be, but it's my tendency is to have a kind of pessimistic, cynical interpretation of the world. And so a lot of maybe more typically optimistic, encouraging ideas I sort of dismiss, and I think that psychedelics can allow me to reduce my guarded, cynical attitude and accept like really often extremely basic ideas. These are not, um, you know, complicated philosophical propositions, you know, just things like be nice to other people as much as you possibly can because it will make them happy and that will make the world a better place. So do your best to be really nice to people, something like that. Um, Whereas, it, you know, it's obvious that it's good to be nice to other people, but it can really help you um, internalize those obvious ideas and feel them with a conviction that otherwise might not exist. I would say my current understanding is pretty much everyone's current understanding, which is that, you know, there's a, a number of subtypes of serotonin receptors, especially 5-HT2A and probably to a lesser extent 5-HT1A that respond to some molecules in a certain way that is not totally clear. It seems that there's some second messenger system that's activated and it causes some kind of global change in the activity of the brain. Maybe this is, you know, explained with the Robert Robin Carhart Harris research on the default mode network, maybe not. I don't know that, that, how much explanatory value that really has. I don't know enough about 
that neuroimaging work to say whether it truly offers a, a useful neurological explanation for psychedelic consciousness. So, you know, mechanistically, I'd say that there's a, a good bit known about the structure activity relationship of these molecules and about the molecular neuropharmacology. And maybe there's a decent bit known in terms of global changes in electrical activity and metabolic activity in the brain. But there's kind of a disconnect between these two regions. And, and no one has bridged it all that successfully. And it may be the case that it's such a complicated bridge that there will never be a single explanation that it can be, you know, uh, offered in a satisfactory way in a, a couple sentences. It might end up being extremely, extremely complicated. And if that's the case, then maybe it's better to kind of let these two worlds of experience and chemistry live independently. Um, I think that's sort of what Shulgin did. He actually did you know, very little pharmacology work in his career. It was almost entirely chemistry and subjective experience. And that was, those were the two things that he felt confident in. And I think that not all that much has changed since he was doing that research. I think politically it's very important to do this sort of therapeutic work. Um, and I think that it puts psychedelics in a context that's more comfortable for a lot of people. The success of Michael Pollan's book is really amazing evidence of that. You know, to me, I actually think that that's one of the least interesting components of the entire psychedelic sphere is the clinical aspect um, when it comes to treatment of psychological disorders. I think it's definitely valuable, definitely worth doing, but from my own personal um, interest, it's, I'm more interested in almost everything else. And, uh, but I think it's very important because that feeds into a certain audience. Um, and there's a lot of people that really could benefit from MDMA psychotherapy or psilocybin psychotherapy, and I think that's great. And what I think is really important is that, I guess my major objection to it is that it doesn't often explore new territory in any substantial way. It is from a regulatory clinical perspective exploring new territory, but from the kind of larger view, um, we're looking at, at, you know, MDMA is useful for PTSD. Well, we've kind of known that for a little while, or psilocybin is useful for depression. We've kind of known that for a little while. We're solidifying these ideas that may have been understood in a more sketchy manner previously. But, you know, I would love to see that type of Shulgin experimentation. And I think that the clinical sphere will promote that sort of um, research into new psychedelics that could have superior therapeutic properties. And that is, you know, one of the things that Shulgin was interested in. It wasn't just about pure exploration, although I think that was the majority of it. Um, he did hope that some of these compounds would be used as antidepressants. He even had, you know, a patent for methylone as an antidepressant and um, Ariadne was looked at as a treatment for Parkinson's. And, um, and there were probably several others that I'm not even aware of. I think, again, for political reasons, there's been a, maybe a bit of a push to de-emphasize the craziness of psychedelics. I'm criticized sometimes for showing people that aren't serious people. There's a, there was some PhD student who was writing me angry messages a little while ago saying, how dare you show this person that is smoking DMT? Why didn't you interview Robin Carhart Harris? How dare you show something that isn't Robin Carhart Harris? How dare you show something that isn't at Imperial College of London? You need to be interviewing David Nutt. How dare you? And there's like this idea that you can only tell the story one way, and it has to be about David Nutt and Robin Carhart Harris and that guy at NYU. It has to be the Michael Pollan story, that we all have to repeat the Michael Pollan story, the most palatable sterilized version of the story over and over and over again, where, where the story is intentionally censored to pretend that none of the people have even used psychedelics, right? This is another part of that story, because if we were to acknowledge that they themselves used them and were interested, that would somehow contaminate the research. So we create this sort of, um, this basically a lie to make the whole thing seem more palatable. And I think that it has a lot of potential to backfire. And that's not a criticism of any of those people, by the way. That's not a criticism of Imperial College or of David Nutt or Robin Carhart Harris. It's a criticism of a move to tell the story in a certain way and to criticize anyone that doesn't tell the story in that way. And I think it's absurd because 
whether or not the, the person in this uh, instance they were criticizing me for interviewing this kind of ridiculous DMT shaman guy in the DMT episode of my show. And so, you know, whether or not that he was a good representative of the psychedelic community, he is a person who does this and he's someone that exists in the real world. And if the idea is I shouldn't be able to talk to that person because he doesn't present the image that everybody wants to see, I think that's a bad road to go down. Also, you don't want to do the opposite and only show negative stories, which is what happened in the 60s, where every story was about somebody looking into the sun until they were blind or you know, jumping off a cliff, jumping out a window because they thought they could fly. You need some degree of balance because if there isn't balance, then you're presenting a distorted view of this world. Right, it's, a, it's an uncomfortable truth that both, in, so then, but what, what is really important is to accept that yes, people do jump out windows, people do terrible things, but that doesn't mean the drugs are bad. And exactly, that's I think very difficult. They, they think that the only way that you can accept these things is to deny anything bad about them. I and mean, it happens in the cannabis community all the time. People, I think that they're some of the worst offenders when it comes to that type of thinking. They want to say, oh, you know, it doesn't cause lung cancer. Well, maybe it doesn't cause lung cancer, but it does cause emphysema. So don't pretend that smoking this stuff all the time is good for your lungs. It's almost certainly not good for your lungs. And you're not doing anyone any favors by promoting a lie that it's good for your lungs to smoke constantly. Like, yeah, it's probably almost certainly better than smoking tobacco. In fact, it is definitely better than smoking tobacco, but that doesn't mean that it's better than not smoking. Um, and, and to acknowledge that doesn't mean the cannabis is bad. It's like, I think that I would hope that, these, that we reach a level of maturity where we can just talk about these things in a balanced way, the same way that you could talk about almost anything about, about food. You know, you don't, it, it comes from a very insecure place, this need to always say positive things about something. Like you, you know, if you had a bad apple, this is like a, using an extremely cliched example, um, you wouldn't say, you wouldn't be concerned that it would ruin it for all apples in the future to acknowledge that this one was bad. It's just a, it's, it's like, but, but also in defense of that type of attitude, as immature as it may be, things are very precarious and we're coming out of a, a long history of prohibition that's been like frightening in a way that people of my generation do not fully understand and maybe never will fully understand. And I have seen horrible things, but I am to this day amazed by the stories that I hear from people of an older generation. I know someone that was kicked out of Cambridge for acknowledging that he'd used heroin in the past. That's sort of unfathomable for me to imagine. You know, my hero is Alexander Shulgin, and he has been for really all of my adult life. And I think that he had a, a really amazing way of communicating these things that really spoke to me. And I still think that he set the standard for the best way to talk about these things. Um, when I look to Alexander Shulgin's work, I think that it's timeless. I think that um, his evaluations of these substances are more valuable than the state of the art research at that time. So maybe in a different world, Alexander Shulgin would have been given, imagine if uh, in an alternate world, Alexander Shulgin were given millions of dollars for research in 1973, and he could do whatever he wanted well, all that research, even if you were the most well-funded researcher in the world, it probably wouldn't even be valuable anymore because the pharmacological techniques have completely changed in terms of how these drugs are evaluated. I mean, like you can't even use a lot of that old literature because the, the standard and the understanding of all this stuff just you know, totally changes. So, but the experience is timeless. And I think he understood that. I think he understood that with these animal studies, you often don't capture anything of the essence of what you're actually examining and that the methods will become obsolete and that that would not be the case for his experiences. So that I think is, was a, a tremendously influential idea.